in a world where everyone and their brother has a podcast. One stands alone. It's been called one of the podcasts of all time. Welcome to Internet Killed the Video Store. So do we want to just jump right into the box office? I know you guys are busy. Do we want to do any other show first or just get into the draft? I think draft would be my preference. I don't know. What did you have in mind? I mean, the other stuff, I don't know if you guys have seen or heard it. The Beyonce record or Vampire Weekend. The country record? Civil War. Yeah. Curb, Fallout. Mm, I haven't had a lot of time with any of that stuff except for Fallout. A lot of shaking heads. What do you think of Fallout? Did they finally make a good adaptation? See, well, first of all, let's address that because you keep saying that. Did you forget about The Last of Us? Are you like just completely? No, I like it. I thought that was your statement. Oh, okay. I mean, I like I like Silent Hill. I like Mario. I like <laughs> a couple. <laughs> I like Mario too. Oh, so you're asking me? Okay, yeah. my bad. Did they finally crack the code for you? I think, yeah, I think this one kind of does a little more in a way that that last of us like because yeah i guess you remember my problem with that is like well yeah it's easy to adapt the most cinematic video game of all time right uh but fallout is more of a video game in my mind like or at least more a traditional video game i'm not trying to like shit on the last of us never even played it but um yeah i think that it gets at some of like the you can have like serious stuff in a video game and also like really goofy stuff in the fallout series i think has always done a good job of that of having like really kind of zany stuff that doesn't seem like it should fit with like some of the more darker tones that they try to do and i think this show does a lot of that stuff i don't know it's kind of weird because as i was watching it i was not 100 percent of the time like oh this is a great show and i'm really enjoying this like there were times where i was like this is this is bad uh (laughs) but i still think i think it's closer to to what i'd like to see people try to do with video game adaptations even though yeah at times i was like man this is this is more like twisted metal than it is last of us a lot oh, of the time no. <laughs> and it really made me reflect on jonathan nolan as a writer oh uh, no but i think i'm you know starting to understand him a bit better overall i guess i felt like i noticed the second he stopped doing episodes like there seemed to be a pretty sharp drop at least in my estimation of when he exited the series because he only directed i think the first three yeah and then like pretty soon after that it, it felt like it had a pretty sharp decline in quality see i kind of i feel like it was the opposite for me like those oh wow yeah the first few i was not like terribly impressed by yeah. and i noticed this with some of his Westworld episodes too like he kind of has a slower pace than what i enjoy as a director yeah and uh and some of his action stuff just does not look right like there's a scene yeah. <laughs> where there's some people you know, running as they're getting shot at a thing you see, you've seen a thousand times and like, we know how to do it, but they've managed to make it look so bad. Like these people (laughs) are moving so slow and they're like crouched over, like covering their heads and whoever did the CGI like bullets or whatever they used, it's like all around them. It's like, okay, well they're just getting hit. Like, this right. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and there were yeah. a couple things that I thought looked pretty bad, like that. The the Graboid. No, that's a Tremors thing. Uh, <laughs> Gulper, whatever the the big creature was that they, yeah. like, leaned all of their creatureness on, I was pretty yeah. disappointed by. Uh, yeah. It's like, okay, I wanted more than this and, like, some CGI rad roaches. But yeah. on the other side, like, the ghoul, I think, looked pretty impressive. It's, it's pretty a pretty big feat to do that much like nose deletion in a, in a (laughs) TV show. Like that's, that's not easy shit to do. So it's cool. I thought it looked good. It it did look good for the most part. It looked pretty good. I really liked it. I don't have like hardly any experience with the fallout series. So I was going into the show pretty blind and Mm -hmm. 
I really liked it. I think a lot of it, like the balance of kind of quirky humor with like Cold War political stuff and then like super crazy violent scenes, it yeah. reminded me a lot of Watchmen in that way, just the style and tone of it. Mm-hmm. And maybe a little bit of that's kind of like the ghoul and Dr. Manhattan lining up a little bit with the CGI character that's mm. a little supernatural, but... I think this is going to bum you out, but for me, maybe it was just because it's an Amazon property, but uh, my mind went to the boys more so than Watchmen. Like, I feel like whoever's producing over at, you know, (laughs) uh, Amazon Studios or or whatever was like, we need another boys. We need another one of these, right? (laughs) And I guess, I don't know, the boys is obviously pulling from Watchmen in a lot of ways, but uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's funny. Did you guys hear any of the beef songs between J. Cole and Kendrick? And J. Cole did one called Might Delete Later, and then he literally deleted it because he got embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> J. I Cole don't... got embarrassed? Yeah. Dude, was it that bad? Said it was said it was the cringiest shit he ever did, and he regrets it, and he had it taken off Spotify. What about Kendrick? Kendrick hasn't responded yet, and that was basically what Drake's whole diss was about because Kendrick should have responded by now, and he hasn't. What? And then Drake's diss also literally put words in the mouth of Tupac Shakur uh, by using AI to have a Tupac and Snoop Dogg co-sign on his diss track. <laughs> That's so fucking stupid. Why is Drake doing diss tracks again? Uh, because Kendrick keeps making fun of him. <laughs> I mean, Drake deserves to be made fun of, though. He does. And I feel like if Tupac were alive, he would not sign with the Canadian... Nickelodeon soap opera star named Aubrey. Nope. <laughs> It'd be the guy from California. Yep. But yeah, that stuff's all kind of silly. Yeah, I'm kind of bored with it already, to be <laughs> honest. All right. If we're getting down to brass tacks here. We're going to jump right into the summer movie box office draft. Real quick, did you like Civil War? I did like Civil War. Yeah. It looks so fucking good. I really liked it. I also could see why a lot of people wouldn't like it. Because it seems like one of those movies where the marketing is very misleading. Like, it seems Uh, like it wants to sell itself as a big spectacle. And the movie's kind of just saying, like, no, war sucks. Like, this shouldn't be something that people are interested in actually happening. (laughs) That's a cool message, though. It is. It's a really cool message. And I feel like I kind of got that just because I'm a nerd and I've been following the movie and Alex Garland interviews. So I kind of knew what to expect going in. But, like, just seeing the trailers and, like, the White House blow up and all this shit. I see why a lot of people are like, well, they didn't even touch on the politics or the battles and stuff. It's like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not the point. Cool. I'm excited so, for it. Yeah, it's really good. It's cool to see Kirsten Dunst go from like bubbly Mary Jane Watson cheerleader and bring it on to this like desensitized cold war photographer. Like she's great in it. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, it was great. All right. So the reason we're all here, let's get down to it. The 2024 Summer box office movie draft, also known as Sumbo 24. (laughs) Basically what this is, all three of us will take turns selecting movies from the summer calendar based on how much money we think they're going to make at the U.S. box office over the summer. Uh, Last year, how this went, I picked The Flash first overall. It was a huge bust. I finished last basically because of that and Disney overall. I uh, bought into the Haunted Mansion (laughs) reboot as well and Elemental all three of which underperformed. Max finished second with Guardians of the Galaxy and Into the Spider-Verse being his big earners. And Ben won and made us all watch Patriot Season 1 because he got... I guessed on everything. Oppenheimer and Barbie somehow falling to ninth and 10th overall. I don't know how they slipped that far. That's like Mahomes falling in the draft to the Chiefs. Let's see. How do we want to do this? Are we good with the format for the draft? Is the snake draft still an act, or should we just go one, two, three to keep it from going? I like it. <laughs> you like the snake draft? Fuck yeah. I won. <laughs> it benefited you. So yeah, I could see that. Max, are you comfortable with this? Are you yeah, comfortable sure. with this? <laughs> I feel like I caught I threw too many foreign sports terms at Max last time and he just got <laughs> sideswiped into taking fast X and Transformers. That's not what happened. No, I just... had regret. It just shook out in a weird way, but I, I don't care. I already know that we're just watching season two of Patriot next year. <laughs> uh, I know how these things go. Okay, so do we want to extend it a week into September so we can include Beetlejuice? Because otherwise, I don't know if there's going to be 15 movies we can pick this year. The field is very, very light. Sure. Really? Hmm. Okay. And then do we want to roll the dice for draft order, or do we go like NFL rules where the person with the worst record picks first... 
you'd like that, wouldn't you? I would see it benefits <laughs> me exactly. Or we can go the opposite and reward Ben again and let him go first. Say, since he would. I don't know. You got fucking first last time. It didn't work out too well for you. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know what to do with the first pick, so it doesn't really matter to me. Or I got Ugh. the dice. <laughs> do the dice, dude. Let's dice. Fresh start. Okay. You can have the first pick on numbers. Then what do you want? Pick two numbers. I pick two numbers out of one out of ten. One to six. This is oh. just a sixer. Um. One and six. One and six. Max, what do you want? Two and five. Okay. Mm. It's two. Max got nice. first pick. Oh, shit. All right. Four. That's me. So, Fuck. Ben, you got last pick. All right. But it is a snake draft, so you're going to go twice in a row here at the end. Yep. All right. So, first, on the clock, with the first overall pick in the 2024 summer box office movie draft, Max Hatlam selects... Damn, this is a lot of pressure. I was not <laughs> expecting this. You're on the clock. How much I'm, time do I'm, they give him on the clock in the NFL? I'm already flaking <laughs> on my first pick. Oof. I'm, yeah? Yeah, I'm feeling nervous about it. <laughs> I don't like any of my picks. I just want to put that out there right now. Except for like it's maybe hard. one or two. No, I just mean like I, I think they're going to be horrible movies. A lot well, of yeah. Them. This is, we're just picking what's going to make the most money. Let's clarify yeah. that right away. Yes. All right. Yeah, sorry. I'll stop stalling. <laughs> You stalled. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick Despicable Me Damn Four. It, that, that was, was my, my number first. one pick too. That was my number one pick. <laughs> yeah, I think that's gonna be pretty big. So, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that was exactly mine. There wasn't even right, like a cool. close second for me. I don't really? know what I'm gonna do now. Yeah. Um, See, I actually, that was my second. Really? Ooh. Yeah. I, I got nervous okay. about my first. So. So this is the first year. Or no, it's the third year since the MCU started that they won't release a single movie. It only happened in 2009 and 2020, so there's no MCU movies. The closest thing we got is Deadpool and Wolverine. That's what I'm taking number two. That was my number one. That's that's it. I'm yeah. banking on it. Hopefully, there's enough comic yeah. book nostalgia still lingering around. <laughs> there might be. You know, I think it. Could I thought totally... that last year with the Flash. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that could be the the summer winner. But it could also like really shit the bed in a way that I just don't think Despicable Me Four will. No, I think that's a guarantee. Like, that's the Caleb Williams. Like, He's... Despicable Me Four doesn't get bad worth word about. You know what no. I mean? It's not. It's not one of those things where it's like, oh, it flopped. No, nope. Parent, <laughs> parents matter. need babysitters. It doesn't matter what the exactly. minions are doing in the movie. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's why that fucking Mario movie's been like number one on Netflix for Stop, a year dude. now. All right, Ben, you're third and fourth. Yep. So, so hope you got some good selections. Beetle, just Beetlejuice and the Fall Guy. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, what, what's so interesting? I mean, it's just interesting picks. I wasn't expecting those. What would you have picked, Max? Uh, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't even pick your picks. You did. Yeah, those were not. The Fall Guy is getting a lot of advertisement. That's true. That that could be one. I feel like that one could, yeah, be a big uh, surprise. But yeah, I, yeah. No, I think it it could be one of those like good word of mouth movies. But it could also just be like average. Um, shit. I don't know now. This puts me in a precarious position. Because you were gonna take Beetlejuice. I wanted to. Yeah, <laughs> Michael Keaton's my dude. There you go. Uh, it's flash all over again, Ryan. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go with Garfield. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. I need the safe pick. I can't go too many R-rated movies. I gotta get a family one in. Yeah. Oh, I don't give a shit, dude. This my list is shameless. It's my turn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Inside you're, you're... Out 2, baby. Yes. There we go. Animation is gonna rule this summer, and so am I. Inside Out 2. I don't know why I didn't pick that actually. I was gonna do that, but Elemental scared me last year. I feel like <laughs> I got burned on the Pixar pick. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, a sequel, sequel to yeah. one that people liked loved all right you're up again oh it's me again yeah all right <laughs> joker 2 wait no no that's not on the board yeah what why the not fuck? that should be on there it's not qualified we're doing summer only that's when october that come out? oh uh, october yeah oh shit well i might need to check <laughs> some of my <laughs> others then that's why i sent you the list <laughs> yeah but... ineligible i was like i don't, I don't fucking know. see that I, I, I didn't first. know if there was something something missing off your list. I can't trust you. 
<laughs> that might have been a totally fake list. No, that's real. Like, look I'm, at these. I'm trying to help you. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I just left Joker off the list. That would be shitty. I'm not trying to screw you guys that bad. Well, I didn't... I figured it was on there. I didn't look at the list too hard. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have had Venom 3 by now. Uh, all right, that one doesn't work. Shit. This is all going wrong. Now I see why you were like, there aren't that many. We got a thin draft class. Uh, ah, fuck it. <laughs> Should I do that? No. The, whatever, the bad boys. <laughs> bad boys for life. <laughs> or bad boys ride or die, right? Is that what oh, it's yeah, called? Oh yeah, bad boys for life. That should have been the fourth one. That was the third one. They fucked up. Yeah, well. <laughs> they, they, they got the... The title and out of sequence. Yeah. That was going to be one of my picks. Uh, that's, that's me again. Uh, shoot, what do I want? I think I'm going to go with uh, Furiosa. Okay. Old Mad Max. Hmm. What the fuck is Maxine? Did you see X or Pearl a couple years ago? No. It's the third movie in that series. 80s slasher movie. What is Twisters? Twisters you know is exactly what it, is. what it sounds like. It's a legacy sequel to the best disaster movie ever made. It is. It's what I think it is. Yeah. What's his name? Glenn Powell from Hot Top Gun is the new main dude. All right, we'll do Twisters. Glenn Powell from Hot Topic. We'll do Twisters. This is what happens. I sell you too hard, and then you end up taking fucking Barbenheimer, <laughs> kicking all our asses. Fuck yeah, dude. Now you got Twisters, and we're all going to lose. Oh, no. And then <laughs> Borderlands, if it's after the game. Yes, it is based on the game, right, Borderlands. I pick Borderlands. Oh, is that the Eli Roth thing? He finally yeah, did it? Eli Roth. I think Kevin Hart, Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, there's a bunch of people in it. No, I don't want yep. it anymore. It's a Kevin Hart property. <laughs> no. I Too late. Fuck. Too late. It's going to bomb. They did have to do a lot of reshoots. God. <laughs> that's not, is that a good sign or a bad sign? No, usually it's a bad sign, especially because Eli Roth didn't want to come back and do the reshoots. He had somebody else do them for him. Oh. <laughs> so... Not a great sign. Uh, so Beetlejuice is gone. Fall Guy is gone. Ooh, this guy's still on the board. I'm gonna take Quiet Place Day One, okay. prequel. That was my alternative pick. I was either gonna do that or Furiosa, so I'm glad it's still sitting there waiting for me. See, I'm loading up on the R-rated movies though. At least I got you Garfield. Know. Oh yeah, you got Garfield, you're good, dude. Max, these are your last two picks. My last two picks are, first of all, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. All right, Planet of the Apes. We'll see. We'll see. That's, <laughs> that's about everybody's expectations with that. We'll see. Right. And my last pick is going to be, I don't know, fucking Alien Romulus. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably the biggest Alien fan in the chat, and you yeah. sound so mad. Like, that's the same enthusiasm you had for Transformers Beast Wars last year. <laughs> right? It's not far off, but like, I haven't looked into Alien Romulus. I don't really know what it is. It's been, it's just a weird thing, man. It's Ridley Scott is a weird person, and he's made some stuff I really like. I mean, I've liked all of it, except for like... I don't think Ridley's doing anything with this one. I think he's busy on Gladiator 2. I think that could be maybe a good thing. Yeah. Because... I feel like there was so much retroactive love for Prometheus by the time that Alien Covenant came out, which was like kind of a sequel to that in a way. Yeah. That it seemed like Ridley Scott just kind of came in and like was like, oh, well, people finally like uh, Prometheus. Like it has a cult following. I'll do this tie into that. And it was like, well, I don't know. See, I think I liked Covenant more than Prometheus, but I know everybody hated Covenant. <laughs> I didn't hate Covenant either. Yeah. But. It just seemed like, um, I don't know. I'm gonna watch one of those tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you're just like searching your memory banks and like, oh yeah. shit, I got some blanks here. I need to fill yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's that's what I'm realizing. It's like, wait, maybe I did like Covenant quite a bit. See, I think I would be more on board to see where Ridley Scott's gonna take a third movie than Fede Alvarez, who's only made the Evil Dead remake don't breathe and the girl in the spider's web yeah. and he wrote the last texas chainsaw massacre movie which was terrible <laughs> okay so i'm not super enthused about Dang. i mean i could see somebody else but not him <laughs> well i picked it <laughs> yep you got it <laughs> it's in your arsenal of uh despicable me inside out 2 <laughs> bad boys and planet of the apes <laughs> quite the dream team yeah 
Oh shit, there so is. this is this is my last pick. Who's left? Is nobody gonna take Horizon, Kevin Costner's movie that has a sequel coming out two months later? <laughs> he's got he's got a Horizon in June and a Horizon in August. Wow. Can I get a twofer if I take them both? <laughs> no, no. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't like I don't like any of these. Yeah. I was hoping John Krasinski was gonna pull something out with his kids movie that IF, but all the trailers for that look really bad. Even though I like I have seen the trailer for that, it looks terrible. Steve Carell and Ryan, he got all kinds of favors called in, but the movie looks so bad. Yeah, I don't want to take Machine Gun Kelly the Crow either. <laughs> what else is there? I'm gonna take Harold and the Purple Crayon <laughs> off the board. I keep seeing that name and. I think about looking it up, and then I decide not to. Why, all I know is, is Zachary Levi, kids movie. That's all I need. He'll, he'll, he'll pull it off. All right, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Okay, so you got last pick. Who are you taking? Mr. Irrelevant, last pick in the draft. Who's even left? Still on the board, we have the aforementioned Horizon by actor, director, writer, producer Kevin Costner. Horizon Part 2, starring Kevin Costner, written by Kevin Costner, directed by Kevin Costner. What? <laughs> um, IF, which stands for Imaginary Friend, written by Jim from The Office, starring his wife and a bunch of his friends. Maxine, which you sound really pumped about. Uh, the Crow, where they <laughs> gave one of the Scars Guards a bunch of face tats. Ooh, we got two Shyamalan movies we haven't brought up yet. M. Night directed one called Trap where Josh Hartnett sets a trap at a trap concert. <laughs> and uh, his, <laughs> his daughter directed her first movie called The Watchers. And we got a Strangers reboot. So yeah, you got a lot of good choices. Back to Black, Amy know. Winehouse. I feel like the fucking Kevin Costner one might, might do well. Do you want the first one or the sequel? Maybe the sequel will be better than the yeah, first one. Fuck? The well, why are they coming out like a month apart from each other? Uh, it's experimental. I think the strangers are going to do the same thing too. I think the guy filmed like a trilogy all back to back. Kevin saw what Zack Snyder pulled off with Rebel Moon, and he was like, "I can do that." <laughs> Kevin's doing this fourfold. The first two come out this summer. The next two come out next summer. They're not coming out. I'm I'm picking Horizon One. Horizon One. <laughs> Mortgage his house. He believes in this. All right. <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I think that's why he's getting divorced and got fired off Yellowstone. He's got a lot going on. The it's a passion project. Hey, what, what's going on with that? Yellowstone. Yellowstone? I, I think they're going to make a final half of a season without him, it sounds like. Uh, gotcha. Kind of seems like he just wants to make Yellowstone himself with these Western movies know, he's starring right? in. <laughs> so you guys didn't listen to Beyonce's country record? Oh, is that it for Sumbo? I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> All right, we pulled it off. We're done, yeah. Horizon right. was the last pick. Same punishment as last year. We all got to watch something that somebody else's picks. Yup, right. <laughs> and you already cool. know. That's it. on Internet Killed the Video Store. We have Adam Turla of Murder by Death. Huge fan of yours. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. So one of the things whenever I'm talking about your band, I struggle to find the words to properly describe it. And you see stuff like alt country or indie goth or punk western, and none of that really seems to encapsulate it. So like in your own words, how do you describe your sound? I say if it's like if I'm like at the bank and the teller is like murder by death what's that which happens <laughs> like a lot because i do like all our admin so i talk to like you know the insurance and blah 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 uh i just say oh it's like spooky western and i, <laughs> I say that because it, to me it feels like it sounds like something <laughs> and it like anybody can imagine what that is to some extent like they know what those two words kind of mean but I mean, we started in the like indie scene and then we kind of um, got a little like adopted by more like the punk scene as we started to like go more national. And so, we, you know, we've jumped around a lot, too, depending on who is uh, who we just like form relationships with at the time. There have been bands that, you know, now that like the last 10 years, like Americana is bigger. So suddenly we're playing with more bands like that because there's more of them. 
But 20 years ago, I mean, I was using the sort of Western motif as a, a device because nobody was putting like Western sounds in indie rock or whatever. It just wasn't very common. So I thought it was like, oh, that would be cool. That would be like a bit of an identity. And um, now it's way more common. So there's actually like more bands we can play with. And uh, in some ways it's made it easier. In some ways it's made it harder because it's saturated. So, you know, we just sort of try to roll with the punches and just keep making music and trying to have fun. Are you thankful that the deathcore heavy metal scene has finally died down so you're not getting confused for that whole era? We still do. I can't, still tell, do. You, <laughs> I can't tell you how many opportunities uh, we've lost because like, oh, we were like all set to play the street festival. And then their insurance company was like, we can't have a band called Murder by Death play. And they're like, no, 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 it's it's actually kind of nice music. <laughs> and uh, that's what happens when you name your band when you're 19, you know? It's uh, <laughs> not the uh, brightest move on our part. Were there any runners up that you're like, man, we should have went with that or? You know, they were all pretty bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> at one point we did, we played a show. We played one show while we were like transitioning to new names and we called ourselves uh dawn of the dead for a night <laughs> and uh i don't know if that would have been better or worse but um <laughs> you know i think we just never imagined ever that we would be out of like the sort of like indie diy scene it just didn't seem possible that we would have a 25 year career and or it's 24 this year, I guess. We did not have the foresight. So you guys got started in Bloomington, Indiana. Were you from around there or did you guys kind of meet at college? Yeah, we all, so I went to, I grew up in Detroit. I moved to Bloomington in 99, fall of 99 for college. And I met most of the band that year. And we, I started jamming that fall with uh, Vincent, our original keyboard player in the dorms. We were just like making music. And then by the <laughs> next uh, spring semester we've got together a couple other members and we played our first show and it had everybody that was in the lineup that we would have for like the next like 600 shows or something <laughs> except sarah and then she came to school in 2000 she played our second show with us and then that was the beginning of like doing all that kind of stuff for a few years until we finally started getting more like opening slot type tours. So in your guys' college years, what was the scene like in Bloomington as far as music and DIY spaces? Tons of bands, lots of good bands. We, there was an anarchist bookstore uh, <laughs> called uh, Secret Sailor that we used to play. But really, I promoted a lot of basement shows and I did something like 50 or 60 shows. It was crazy. So we had like a college rental house and we would do a $5 ticket that would get you a cup for the kegs. <laughs> and um, then we would bring in, we do four band bills and we would often play as one of the bands. And um, I started bringing in touring acts that I was into or that needed a show from 2000 to 2003. The bands that got big that played the basement were, I mean, we had My Morning Jacket, Coheed and Cambria played twice. We had like Merchant City soundtrack, a bunch of like Midwest indie stuff, like instrumental stuff that I was into. Those like thrill jockey bands and like, it was really fun. I mean, we, we had a really good run of gigs and, you know, we would put 200 people in the basement and it was wild. I mean, we, the ceilings and the walls, uh, we soundproofed by, we would go around and all the rich kids in town would leave for the summer. They would just put their furniture on the sidewalk. We would take all the couch curtains and pillows and we would liquid nails them in the rafters for soundproofing. And the cops never busted a show. It was amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, it was great. I mean, it was a really fun scene. There was really good local bands. There was a label, Secretly Canadian and Jag Jaguar, mm -hmm. that um, started there. And so we would uh, have a lot of those bands come and sometimes do gigs or we'd play like an event with them. So there was a, a culture of uh, indie music that was brewing there. Yeah, right on. So yeah, you guys are kind of known for staging unique venues and doing your Stanley Hotel shows once a year. You've got the cave shows in the summer. Yeah. What is the weirdest in a not cool way place that you've played? Hmm. Um, that's a great question. Um, I feel like there's two not cool things that happen on tour. It's uh, where you play possibly, or it's often where you sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so I think for our first like 600 shows, we'd never gotten a hotel room. We would either like sleep in the van or we would sleep on somebody's floor, like, you know, nine out of 10 times. And, you know, sometimes it was just like, 
the person's wasted or they're really like, you know, you know, nine out of 10 times they were great and they're cooking your breakfast and they're angels. But the bad times, like I have this memory of this one like super punk house that was in like Arkansas and the people were nice, but like the backyard was literally like a 12 foot pile of trash, like a landfill. <laughs> and the house just had like roaches everywhere. And we were like sleeping next to like ro- and roach and rat traps in this giant, like basically an empty mansion that I think they were just squatting at. Oh, wow. And um, that was my impression is that they just let us sleep there because they knew it was empty. <laughs> and so, you know, stuff like that. I think when you're young, that stuff feels really kind of like cool and adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> but you get a little bit older and you're like, fuck that. <laughs> just <laughs> No, thank you. Definitely. I have done that. I have adventured with the best of them. I, you know, I can't think of any like truly dangerous show settings. I mean, I've been electrocuted at clubs because the wiring was bad, but I'm okay. (laughs) I, you know, there are million fights and that kind of stuff. Sure. But like music, the last decade or so, the clubs are so much nicer than they used to be. The crowds are bigger. Um, There's more tickets cost more, which actually makes the venues better. Like the music scene now in no way resembles the scene that we came up in, you know, for better or worse. Yeah. Like, I know that there's people out there still playing house shows, obviously, but like there used to be like a certain level of crappy club that like every town has. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's less of those than there used to be. Yeah. It seems like it, which is, yeah. It's like, I don't know if that's a problem. I mean, when I talk (laughs) to the younger bands, they're always just like, they're playing all these great spots. I'm like, wow, cool. (laughs) Good for you. Yeah, it's kind of the survival of the fittest. It felt like it was. I mean, you know, $5 shows at, at a venue, like, you're not going to get much out of that venue. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, there's something about kind of the passion it takes to be committed when there isn't a huge financial incentive. <laughs> well, I think that that's the, that's the big thing that I would say was, like, if you were trying to be an indie musician in the early 2000s, like, you knew you were going to be poor. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was no illusion that you were going to like make it or something like I nobody I talked to back then had like big ambitions then I met some people who were more like from like when we met the guys from like Thursday and My Chemical Romance they had ambition and I was like huh <laughs> like, <laughs> they were talking about like you know the next level or whatever and like especially My Chemical Romance they they had like wild ambition and I remember being like huh I never even thought about that and <laughs> then what do you know they're like the biggest band on the fucking planet <laughs> well, you guys have kind of carved your own path as far as your unique sound and even putting out your own records, starting campaigns on Kickstarter. Yeah. Do you think that kind of hard work ethic has helped your longevity as a band to keep you guys going and passionate about what you're doing? Yeah, I think it's like a thousand little decisions that got us to sort of like what we really are. And, you know, I mean, we grew up listening to like Fugazi and that kind of stuff, and we definitely admired the uh, ethic of that kind of like ethical punk rock and that DIY mentality. That was like the kind of aspirational stuff that I was thinking about was like, how do you be really like, like I was talking about those house shows. I never took a single dollar for those house shows. Like our band always played for free. So that we would give the money to the bands that were touring. Yeah. And like it was that kind of thinking that was like what I saw as ideologically exciting. So, you know, at some point you have to say like, well, okay, I, I got to pay the bills. So you know, and I got all these people depending on me and like I was, I was in charge of all that stuff. So we started eventually transitioning, you know, more into the club thing kind of naturally as just happens with fans. And um, what ended up happening is we started doing more of the work ourselves or I just did it in a lot of cases where I was like, well, this merch company wants to take 20% to fill all the orders you know, and that's a lot of money. And then they want to ship using this company and that, that company is really expensive and it will cost the customers $5 more. And so I was like, what if I just ship it? So then I like, okay, I'm doing mail order. It was the same thing. Like this label didn't want to press this record that I wanted to press. I was like, well, can I press it? And they're like, okay. So then I started doing all our vinyl and it just, it was like a ton of things that happened like that where suddenly I just found myself doing it and I was responding to all the questions and suddenly it was just like, well, why don't I just deal directly with the audience? They seem nice enough. And, (laughs) you know, it just became like apparent as the internet provided more uh, opportunities and um, 
it just became it became a totally different marketplace than when we had started. I mean, bands didn't really have like websites when we started, <laughs> which is crazy to think about now. It makes me feel a thousand years old. <laughs> For sure. Things have definitely changed quite a bit. You guys are obviously hugely influenced by movies. Did you guys have a local video store that you'd visit in Bloomington? Yeah, it was called Plan 9 from Outer Space. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> great selection. And there's one in Louisville that we would go to called Wild and Wooly. Uh, one of the guys from Slint opened it and they closed about eight years ago. And it was such a bummer because you could walk in there and they had it like sorted by like director or by genre, but like niche genre. Yeah. And uh, when I moved here, we bought like a totally screwed up old house that need, and, and we spent like seriously like 10 years fixing it up. And um, we would just be whooped at the end of the day from doing construction. And uh, we would walk to the video store and just be like, just tell me what to watch. I'm so tired. <laughs> and they would just give us the coolest, weird, obscure stuff that I'd you know, never seen. Be like, oh, this is a weird John Carradine movie I never saw. Or like, what's this weird David Lynch? I missed this one somehow. Or like, it's just interesting stuff. Yeah. I love, I, I love, I still love film. Does it bum you out a little bit that it seems like most of the creative energy in Hollywood's getting pushed towards TV? You know what? I at first I think I felt that way, and now I'm like, I've seen some good shows. Like, yeah. what can I say? <laughs> I'm watching Free Body Problem because I read the books, which is like uh, the crazy sci-fi futurist story. Yeah. And Netflix released it last week, and it's the same showrunners as Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing a really good job with a really tough project, and so. What can I say? Like the long format has advantages too. Yeah, for sure. So a big debate around here is licensed music in movies. Mm. How do you feel about the needle drops? Like when, just when they drop a song in? Or yeah. what do you mean? Like edited songs? Kind of like the, uh, I don't know, James Gunn or Quentin Tarantino obviously uses right. a lot of pre-existing music in movies rather than traditional yeah. soundtracks. Well, I mean, I think it's it's filling in some of the financial loss that came from record sales disappearing for bands. And so I think most bands will tell you, bring it on. And <laughs> some, I mean, uh, Tarantino mm -hmm. used one of our songs in a trailer for Inglorious Bastards. Mm -hmm. And when I got that email, I'll tell you, I was pretty excited. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, for me as a fan to have any kind of like association with something that you grew up and that influenced you in a way, I mean, I think it's actually, it's quite an honor. And, you know, they're crazy because sometimes they pay really well and sometimes they pay nothing. And sometimes the one that paid really well, nobody saw it. No one ever mentions it to you. <laughs> and then the one that like 12 people split a thousand dollars, that one, everybody's like, oh my God, that was so cool. And they did that. I was like, cool. <laughs> like, which we got paid. <laughs> but you just kind of hope that they keep coming in and you hope that you don't get in a position where it's like for something that sucks. Yeah. We've not had to make a choice to be like, well, do you want $50,000 to have an ad for something that you actively will not purchase? You know, like I haven't <laughs> had to make that choice. And I know what I would do because I'm a weirdo, but like there's a lot of companies that I don't support. And I'm, I know people who have taken money from those companies, you know, <laughs> yeah. especially if you got kids, you're like, well, that could be a year of college or, you know, <laughs> like who knows? I, I'm glad to not have to make those choices. Right. Because the only the only people who want to use our stuff are like usually a little like outsider. Yeah. It definitely seems like there's this kind of initiation to being brought into the murder by death circle. It's almost like a cult movie that your friends have to show you. And then once you see it, you have this shared language. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's we, you know, we just don't have any real commercial success or accolades of any kind. So like it it's I mean, the band is just a hundred percent grassroots. Whether we meant to do that or not, that's how it ended up. <laughs> and I think it's been a really great career. Um, honestly, um, it's exceeded all my expectations. I'm, I feel lucky to have gotten to do this for so long. I mean, I started this year. My big goal is to write songs for a new album. And I'm still having fun writing. I'm still excited about it. I think the writing is the most satisfying part of the whole thing for me because you're literally just pulling you know, something out of nothing. It's a magic trick to write a song and it feels fun to be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, you guys have been a band for 24 years. Mm. What items are still left on the bucket list for Murder by Death? You know, I asked that question of some friends recently and you know, people were like, Carnegie Hall, Sydney Opera House. And I was like, eh, <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. I would, if somebody actually sent an offer to us right now, I would be like, 
yep, let's do it. But I don't really think of things that way. I think for me, the the best stuff has been being able to do this and being able to do it on my terms is the best thing. That's that's the like the real achievement. I've never had to like change the way I want to write a song to make it more accessible so that it'll be played on the radio. Like nobody's ever forced me to change the art or whatever. You know what I mean? Like we have never had any, everything is just what we're doing. We're making that call for better or worse. <laughs> like we just got to do our thing. And um, in addition to that, I would say, you know, there's venues like I've heard like the gorge in Washington, like, sure. That, that sounds really cool. I'd love to play that. We got to play Red Rocks with our friends, the devil makes three few, like five years ago. That was definitely a, a thing that I wanted to do. Yeah. We finally toured Australia about five years ago. That was something I always wanted to do. Nice. But I mean, we even got to play, my mom is from Italy and um, we got to play uh, a show 10 minutes from where she was born. And like my cousins came and my aunts oh, and nice. uncles. <laughs> I mean, like that was crazy. I mean, yeah. Like that was a crazy thing to be able to do. So I think that was pretty important for me. That's that's more how I think about it is just like, I'm glad to have gotten to do it. I like thinking about the kid, the 18 year old, when I started this band, getting to have all those experiences. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, there's a, been a big swing of traditional kind of pop music writers going into film scoring. Have you guys ever considered doing anything like that? Oh, I would love to. I mean, yeah, the problem is, is I just don't know the right people. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a kind of thing that I think maybe a couple of years down the road when, when things simmer down a little bit, I might try to be more personally proactive about making those relationships. But, you know, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and like, I'm not in LA, you know, I, right. I don't have a elite community of people who work in the industry, you know, that I can be like, hey, can you talk to your buddy, you know, on <laughs> <Hans> Zimmer? <laughs> like, like, and, you know, I don't know. It's like John, John Williams. And you know, anybody who is willing to give me some pointers, but uh, I scoring a movie would, I think for a long time was a goal of mine, which now I'm sort of like, I, I think, I think I realized like how competitive that is. And I don't know that I am competitive enough to get to the point where I get to start doing it. I read online somewhere that you guys were contacted about doing a song for Red Dead Redemption 2. Was there any truth to that? Yeah, we wrote. So, okay. So, yes, I wrote a, this is the crazy, actually, this is, a, this is what really happens in publishing. <laughs> I wrote a song. I went in and recorded it by myself for that game. You know, that must have been. 15 years ago or something. Oh, wow. They were like, Hey, that's, this is cool. Can you slow it down? So I was like, ah, I'm going to, so I go back into the studio, pay the engineer. I do it slower. They're like, okay, cool. Can you make it more sparse? I'm like, ah. and at this time I'm like such a broke person. I have no money. We're like making nothing. And so like, I'm really going on a limb hoping to get this. And then they, it kind of disappears and they don't use it. Uh -oh. I did have a friend who got a song in that game. Will, William Elliott Whitmore did. But, uh, oh, nice. So a couple of years later, I reworked the song with the whole band and do a totally different version. And we, the song is called Go to the Light. And we put it on our album, Bitter Drink, Bitter Moon. Oh, yeah. It was a sleeper. It wasn't like a big no song that got noticed. Then in 2018, the game, the video game Destiny 2 was like, we want to use this song, but we want the stems for it. Oh, yeah. Well, we hadn't recorded it with stems because it was an old song. So we went in, re-recorded it <laughs> again for that game. And that time they did use it. And it was huge. It was honestly is the biggest placement we ever got because that game like sold a billion dollars in the first day. And um, it just got so many plays because of the gamer community. So it was really kind of a cool experience because um, I actually I play video games. so. It was fun for me. Yeah. Is there anything fun you've been playing recently? I'm playing Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> super nerd. I'm also playing in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign right now. There you uh, go. That my, my friend Taylor, she's like the, a next level DM. Like I hadn't played since my 20s, <laughs> like college kind of stuff. And she does AI for her work. And she's like generating audio and text and images of every character we meet and maps all using ai and oh, like wow <laughs> so she prints out like these photos of every character we meet she's insane like uh, <laughs> it's, it's so over the top and we're, we're just like thank you for making this such a wild experience yeah that's great <laughs> when i'm home i'm trying to i'm trying to find more time to just relax uh because I've, I've basically just been 
grinding for over 20 years where I just had like no free time. Well, yeah, you guys are so quick to turn around the Patreon perks to your fans and supporters offering up the exclusive tracks and, you know, doing all the cover songs that you guys put out so quickly. Do you guys have your own recording set up now too? When when I do a Patreon recording, I'm just literally setting my phone on a chair and pressing record. Oh, gotcha. Um, <laughs> like I'm using the mic that's on the phone. My bandmates, some of them have home studios or uh, recording capabilities uh, where a friend has a studio or whatever. Okay. So they, they've done a couple things. You know, the Patreon, we're really trying to make it worth it for people. And, you know, th- we're doing like a lot of features and it's a lot of work. I also think it's just a better format for the people who want to dig deeper into the band. Yeah, it gives you guys a great direct line of communication with your fans. Like the whole advancement of the internet seems to be a major asset that's helped to sustain your band. Yeah, you know, it has been. And like, I'm torn on it because, you know, for the first thousand shows we played, we had no social media. It just didn't exist yet. And we didn't get social media until like about, I think like 2007 or eight. and once that started, the workload for the band became like way, way, way more. And we're spending so much time, like whatever, learning Photoshop or like just uploading stuff and like keeping up with comments and content. And it's like, I think it's good, obviously, because I think bands are much bigger, more successful. They can monetize things better to make up for the record industry kind of falling apart. But like, it's also just created another job that's on top of it. And somebody's got to do that job. And so uh, I try to balance it where it's like, I post what I need to. We obviously have to advertise like our tours and when we got a new album or whatever, but I'm trying to like allow myself periods of quiet where it's not something that I have to think about every day. Yeah. Well, like you said, it's kind of hard to find free time because that's always there. (laughs) Yeah, no, it is. And like, and I I really like, I'm just juggling so many things. I do so much admin. I was talking about this the other day with a friend where, she was a new friend and she was like, I think when I met you, I thought like he's a musician and he owns a restaurant. And like, I thought like, wow, this guy's the coolest jobs. But then when, whenever we're just like talking, the stuff that you say in passing about the work that you're actually doing, like what you're actually spending your time doing, <laughs> it sounds really hard. And I was like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> like I just do admin all day. I was telling her, I would say that the percentage of time for the band that I spend performing, writing, or playing music is like easily less than 1%. You know, that is like being a musician is the smallest part of what the job that I do is. Most of it is logistics and it's okay. Somebody has to do it. But uh, I do sometimes wonder, man, what if I just got to be like an artist? <laughs> like, what if I just spent all my time making art? Must be nice. Right. <laughs> all right. So we're going on tour this June with a stop here in our home base of Fort Wayne at Middle Waves. Oh, yeah. So looking forward to that. Is there anything else you want to promote on your way out here? No, all our stuff online. You look up the band. There's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, I mean, June will be really fun. That festival sounds fun. I'm excited to get back to Fort Wayne. I haven't played there since the Brass Rail. No, I think there was a show after the Brass Rail show. Yeah, um, uh, CS3. That's the one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my buddy, Jay Bush, who lives in Fort Wayne, helps me with mail order when I'm on tour. I think he was like bartending there or something at the time. Oh, gotcha. But, uh, no, I'm excited to come back. That part of the country is close to home because I'm from Detroit. So a lot of my friends that I went to school with are from Fort Wayne. And my wife's family wow. uh, either lived or vacationed uh, in Angola for like the last hundred years. And so I used to go up there in the summer and spend a lot of time in that area. So gotcha. It's just uh, that part of the state is is pretty great. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got a round of uh, rapid fire either or if you want to do that on the way out here. Let's do it. Okay. So we got number one, Paul McCartney's Christmas Time or John Lennon's So This Is Christmas? Uh the kinks father christmas <laughs> okay I, whenever somebody asks me beatles or stones i say the kinks okay good good alien or predator oh i love them both but the predator the first one yeah it's just there's too many incredible scenes in that one and i like alien aliens more than i like alien yeah i like the director's cut of aliens because i'm <laughs> that nerdy about it <laughs> all right black sabbath or the misfits i grew up listening more to black sabbath okay i don't know now i think both of those are pretty free pretty freaking seminal important bands but i think that i would say that like 
I have listened more to Black Sabbath. Sarah would say Misfits. Okay. Uh, I think you should leave or Tim and Eric, awesome show. Great job. <sighs> That's a tough one. I was recently emailing with Eric Wareheim because uh, he's going to use one of our songs for something. Oh, nice. And uh, we were rewatching some of that. But we also did a cover of Bones from I Think You Should Leave. <laughs> right. That was great. So you're putting me in a political, this is a political question now. <laughs> Spaghetti or the shirt with too many colors? Um, oh, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm going to pass. We can, we can do a draw. That's fine. It's a draw for me. Dookie or the Blue Album? Oh, I was very in the Blue Album in my freshman year of college. Uh, Weezer had been on hiatus and me and a group of friends started playing cover shows in basements where we claimed that we were the original Weezer and that uh, we were, and we just forget that's me. I'm Rivers Cuomo. Nice. And we would just play the blue album start to finish. So we did that for a couple of years, uh, maybe like 10 shows. But that was the big, they were both big records for me, but the blue album was like, I learned all those songs. All right. So you get a call to score a movie for either Denis Villeneuve or Christopher Nolan. Who are you rolling with? Uh, I would think I would go Villeneuve, I okay. think. Gotcha. Probably more suited to our style, too. Not just a personal choice, but the answer is David Lynch. Okay, again. okay, gotcha, gotcha. So if you've got to uh, characterize Murder by Death in four songs, which four are you picking? Hmm, okay. Um, I feel like there's so many eras. Um, I would say the song Until Morale Improves from who will survive because that kind of started us down this whole road of the the spooky western thing um <laughs> gotcha i feel like lost river really stuck out for me as the more developed side of like our more beautiful side of songs as well last night on earth is like kind of a pinnacle high drama Murder by Death song, like super dramatic, spare, and then shreddy at the, at the it, with a like a big climax outro. Yeah, you guys have great outros. They're so fun to write. You know, it's so fun to just get out of the songwriter thing sometimes. And then maybe like Brother, because that was like the sing along kind of MBD prototype that really took off. Awesome, man. Well, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Go, cool, man. Awesome. Take care. Yep, thanks. For more, visit internetkillthevideostore.com.